Welcome to Close the Gap, where we thoughtfully engage with CEOs and top industry leaders all working to close the female equity gap in the C-suite and boardroom. Christine Gannon, the CEO of Brightworks Consulting, and Dr. Antoinette Farmer-Thompson, a senior leader with Arizona State University, host insightful conversations responsible for moving the needle for female participation in the C-suite. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Close the Gap. We are super honored and excited to have our guest with us this morning. We have Tony Felice, who has been a tremendous support and just all around amazing help to us as we have kicked off this movement. And um, we're just super excited to have Tony today. So welcome. Thank you so much. It's uh, an honor to be here. Thank you. So a little bit about Tony. Tony is the founder of the Police Agency. He's named one of 20 people to know in advertising and marketing by the Phoenix Business Journal and Ranking Arizona, awarded his agency one of the top 10 PR firms and top 10 advertising agencies in Arizona in 2020. His multiple decades career has taken him from the halls of US Congress to Hollywood, California, and now he spends his time in Phoenix and San Diego. His clients have included Microchip, the Arizona State Fair, Adopt Technologies, International Association of Fire Chiefs, and many others. Appointed by former mayor, now Congressman Greg Stanton, appointed Tony as a member of the Ad Hoc Committee for Fast Track Cities. His volunteer work includes serving as Chief Communication Advisor to former First Lady Nicole Stanton and serving as board member on many nonprofits, including Local First Arizona, Arizona Community Foundation, Phoenix Art Museum, and many others. Tony recently overcame a six month life ending diagnosis and the resulting experience led him to understand how mindfulness can overcome any challenge and can be harnessed to transform a business's bottom line. He holds a bachelor's degree in operations management, summa cum laude from Arizona State University and most recently completed the pandemic crisis communication course from Harvard University where he intends to finish his master's degree. His agency can be found online at policeagency.com. Tony, welcome. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. <clears throat> I'm We're so, so glad. <laughs> We're so glad to have you. I mean, you've been such a partner for us and there, there are so many things I wanna ask. And what came to mind though, you, you've gone from DC to Hollywood, right? And when we first met you, you believed immediately in what we were trying to do. And when I think about Hollywood, we had the conversation at one point there that there are all of these different TV shows that talk about women leaders, secretary of state, and then scandal. Well, yeah. So there were all of these um, uh, all of these articulations in movies and in shows, but yet we weren't getting it done in corporate America. And you said to us, I think women make phenomenal leaders. I think what you guys are doing is incredible. Can you take us back to maybe from your perspective, like how you came into that perspective? Wow. Well, I am fortunate that I have lived in so many um, amazing places and I've got to do so many wonderful things. Um, my trajectory took me from DC to New York. I worked on Park Avenue uh, for KPMG Pete Marwick before I went to Hollywood, California. And I've seen women in so many roles. Um, even in the 1990s, I was so impressed with uh, the women leaders that I encountered. I remember the chief general counsel at KPMG, Pete Marwick, was female, and um, I was so inspired by her. Um, in, in Washington, D.C., I was fortunate enough to interact with um, members of Congress and also um, uh, senior members of the administration in, um, in Washington, D.C. that were female, and the courage and um, the capacity for, for grit, I guess is probably the best word that would resonate with you, ha has always been inspiring to me. 
Um, as a young gay man, of course, I was always inspired by divas. In fact, some of the most brilliant women in history um, have emerged um, through uh, difficult times to be um, to leave their mark on the world. Most mm-hmm. recently, I've been fascinated with uh, with uh, Princess Diana's story again, and uh, everything that she overcame um, and still uh, was able to express this incredible spirit of leadership and kindness and compassion that still resonates with us today. <clears throat> Fantastic. Let's bring it a little bit local. Talk to me, uh, talk to us about Arizona and why we spent a long time talking about this on the phone before the podcast. Talk to us about your perspective on Arizona leaders and why women leaders in Arizona are so effective. Well, (laughs) Arizona is a crazy state, isn't it? (laughs) We are definitely not the sum of our parts or our or the DNA of our brand that's expressed outside of our borders. Um, we live in a state where we've had four female governors, and up until the last year, uh, the only state in the union to have two consecutive female governors. That's quite significant, right? Um, I've been so fortunate to, um, in my own sphere, uh, to be inspired by women leaders who, um, who, who, who aren't necessarily interested in asking for permission to change the world. They just have a capacity for intellect and kindness and compassion that make them, um, uh, it it, it makes for that secret sauce for an amazing leader. I'm inspired by uh, Nicole Stanton. uh, uh, She's the EVP and general counsel of Harvest Health now, uh, but she was the former uh, first lady of Phoenix, former governor Rose Mofford, Um, Cindy Dash, the owner of Changing Hands, who Um, Most of the time, Arizona is a flyover state for um, significant authors, but Changing Hands brings the biggest authors, including former President Obama, Stephen King, J.K. Rowling. All of these people come to Arizona for book signings, largely, well, entirely dependent upon the work that she's done. But Cindy Dash was also instrumental in turning downtown Phoenix around. She was one of the founders of uh, the Art Walk on Phoenix, uh, down in downtown Phoenix, then there's Kate Wells, who runs the Children's Museum. Um, Lauren Bailey, the owner of uh, the co-owner with Craig DeMarco of Upward Projects. She started as a server, and as she was 23 years old, and Craig said, I want you to be my general manager. And she said, I don't want to be your general manager. I want to be your partner. And now <laughs> they're a multi, 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 multi-million dollar corporation with restaurants in Arizona and Houston and Denver and California, and they're just, uh, she's absolutely inspiring. Laura Capello, who is the CEO of Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Mm. We are autoimmune disease kind of pals, but I see the work that she's done and she's just absolutely brilliant. Tammy Crawford, who um, whose daughter suffered from Lyme disease and said, you know, there there is no good research out there. So she single-handedly raised half a million dollars to fund research at TGen. Um, into Lyme disease, because there is no good diagnostic test in uh, the United States. And Tammy McClade, who runs the Flynn Foundation, who sat on the Local First board with me. I was on the board of Local First for so long, Kimber used to joke that I, I swept up after. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I used to be at the second level of duck and decanter. Kimber Lanning started Local First as an online listing of the best locally owned independent uh, uh, businesses in Arizona, and she is a force to be reckoned with at the legislature. People quake in their boots when they see her because she's a fierce advocate for economic development. These women are so inspiring to me, and they have a quality that, uh, that they have uh, uh, this certain mix of qualities that I'm happy to go into with you that I just see as, a, as an observer, you know, um, and I've just been so thrilled to be wor- to have worked with some of them on some really incredible things for Arizona that help children, um, that help people suffering from disease, that that help the arts, and also um, make the make uh, the state of Arizona amazing through economic development efforts. So that's kind of my perspective of some brilliant women in Arizona. Oh, that's fantastic! I. I, I'm so pleased to to hear you mention so many of them. Uh, I've met some and know some, but we'll do a little bit more research on others. And as I think about that, Tony, I think about um, just really your background. You are exceptional and expert at not just marketing, 
but creating movement. And you've spent your life's work doing that in, in the nonprofit sector, as well as running a very successful business. So our question to you is, when you think about women leaders being at the top of organizations, representing um, really equally um, at the top of organizations, it's a sustainability issue for us. We know that when women are present, companies perform better. Earnings per share, all of the financial indicators uh, say so. So it's important to us that this movement really gets started. And so from your perspective, what's really going to, to help that without this being a huge political issue, like this is a sustainability issue. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely, 100%. The scales of justice, the scales of equality have two buckets, right? So this isn't a male versus female thing. This is, the, this is an understanding of equilibrium. This is an understanding that the most amazing things happen when we are in harmony, when we are in equilibrium, right? And there are characteristics that women bring that men do not bring to the workplace. Um, women listen. Right. They women listen first, then they form a hypothesis, then they build a coalition, then they make a difference. Men are different. Men talk, men convince people to follow them, and then they forge ahead. Then they make a hypothesis to support their belief. <laughs> Completely different perspectives. I love One that. is not necessarily better than the other. It's just their different perspectives. And combined, you can imagine the force that could happen, right? Um Women bring out humanity in others. Um, and I have to apologize to the male of my species because this is not criticism, this is an observation. But women bring out the humanity in other people. Men tend to display humanity and expect to be rewarded for it, right? Wow. <laughs> right. A, a study by the Center for Economic Policy Research in the World Economic Forum back in August of this year found that countries led by women systematically and system and significantly had better COVID outcomes than countries led by men. Yes. And I believe that in my personal ob observations, it's, it's that women act faster and more decisively in times of crisis and more slowly and more collaboratively, co collaboratively in times of peace. And that's what makes them really good leaders. Um, there's not a, I think women, they just have this internal, I love to use this word, zhuzh, right? <laughs> <laughs> go out and you check yourself, right? You zhuzh yourself. Well, women have this zhuzh, and I think it's inherent in their DNA. It comes from being female. It comes from being nurturing. It comes from um, uh, raising children on the front line. And even if they don't raise children, they still have this built into their DNA when they know what's an emergency and what's not, right? You guys intuitively know when your hair's on fire and when it's not. And I think that's what makes for great leaders is because they, when a woman intuitively understands that we're in the midst of a crisis, that's when she puts on that leadership hat and that's where she makes decisions decisively. That's so really how are we, what do you think we need to do for a movement specifically in Arizona to ensure that there's representation at the highest levels, um, government and corporate? Number one, I think, is to remove the political um, quality to the discussion, number one, oh. and make it a systems. We start focusing on it being a systems problem. But more importantly, we have to demonstrate, I think we have a responsibility to demonstrate the impact it has on the bottom line. I believe there's a 20-year study by Charles yeah. Schwab or one of the other uh, institutions that looked at companies that do the right thing. And how they define doing the right thing is... Um, uh, very, very narrow in scope. <clears throat> One, they, they have a diverse board or they have a female led board or, at le or a female CEO um, mm -hmm. that they do the right thing in the world, right? That they reduce their, their carbon footprint, that they have a very strong corporate social responsibility program. They found 
that those kinds of companies fall into a certain category. And there's a whole investment category could so called socially responsible investing. And it's not just about investing into green or biotech or whatever, but it's investing in companies that do the right thing. And they have found that companies that do the right thing have double than expected returns on, to shareholders, right? So we're seeing that companies that do the right thing, including uh, embracing diversity and inclusiveness, make more money. Well, number so if we can present that, number one, right? And, and that's kind of how we move the needle with Local First. Um, it was a political discussion for a long time. People are like, oh, you're, 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 you're breathing down my neck about shopping local. Well, it's so convenient for me to shop Amazon. When we started talking about the fact that three quarters of that dollar, 75 cents spent at a local business goes back into the local economy versus five cents spent at a chain store, people start having different conversations because that money that stays in the local economy actually goes to ball fields, additional fire, police officers. And what people don't take into consideration is those locally owned companies, they hire locally owned companies. So CPAs, printers, uh, mm -hmm. graphic artists, marketing companies, whereas the chains, they have their vendors that are national, right? So we lose all of those resources that could stay in our local economy. The same thing is true when it comes to diversity and inclusion. We are, we are leaving money on the table every single day by not having these women that I just described at the table not having these women leading corporations who understand what a crisis is and know how to act. Yes. So I think when we start having a dollars and cents conversation first, then people will start to take notice, right? Then when we start talking about the balance that occurs between how organizations are led and we need that balance of thought between men and women, then we can start having different conversations. It really is a, a balance between men and women, you know, in terms of thought diversity. Diversity of thought is so powerful. And I want to go back to something that you said related to the women that you spotlight. You said they each had qualities. And, and I'd really like to talk about that for a minute because during this pandemic, we've had almost two, 2 million women leave the workforce because it's too much. Because um, sometimes in some situations, the roles of taking care of children and taking care of the home and taking care of elderly parents and working have not shifted to be more balanced, right? And well, so well, Chris, well, Christine, they got to see what you do every day, right? It, uh, on a serious note, people finally got a chance to see what women do every day. But right. go ahead. That's very true. It really brought a spotlight into mm -hmm. the women, what, what women are doing every day and women just saying, I can't do it anymore. And I, I really, um, I really can't, this is a really old commercial, but do you remember the commercial with, I can bring home the bacon and do all of that. <laughs> right up in the pan. Right? Yeah. right. I can do all those things and work. And, yeah. and I think women during this pandemic were like, I cannot be a teacher. I cannot work full time, take care of my home, feed my family, take care of my elders. I can't do it. And I'm leaving. I'm done. I'm just yeah. done. And so I want to go back to those qualities because I do believe women will come back into the workforce. I think it will look different. I think yeah. that women have stood up to say things need to change. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate it took a pandemic to do that. But but what are those qualities, Tony, that women are carrying in the workplace that will allow them to continue to do the great work that we're, that we're all doing in the workplace? I think what you just described is both unfortunate and necessary at the same time. Um, I can only speak from my own personal experience, right? One of the major, one of the most mm, heart-wrenching and powerful epidemics that I've lived through is the AIDS crisis. In my lifetime, um, I hope no one ever has to face uh, going to more than 10 or 15 funerals in one week, right? Hundreds of my friends died seemingly overnight. And what happened was this amazing thing is that gay men had, the, had held these positions in our community, heads of nonprofits, uh, you know, uh, heads of organizations that help people that were struggling, et cetera, et cetera. It was the lesbian women that stepped in to take over for the men who were dying. Mm -hmm. 
they started to run the organizations. Um, a female leader was a co was one of the co-founders of ACT UP, um, which was an activist organization, an HIV activist organization that made substantial inroads with uh, the then president who had been in office for more than four years and had never once said the word AIDS, even though 100,000 Americans were dead, right? So it was the gay women that stepped up to fill the shoes of the men that were no longer there. And they led the charge in many respects. They, they, they helped shore up our community. And once that job was done, then they were able to disperse. Some stayed, some moved on to other things. And then they started moving, uh, they started turning their attention back to female issues, right? So in times of crisis, women reacted. And in, and in this case, women have maybe exited the workforce because they needed to shore up their homes, they needed to shore up their communities, their families. But I do believe that they will come back and they will come back in force. Wow, wow. Well, this will probably be my last question. So I will ask you, Tony, and thank you for sharing um, so personally. Uh, that That's uh, uh, amazing. I had never thought about it that way. Um, who's been your inspiration? You, you, again, certainly are incredibly successful. Um, you've run a, a, a wonderful marketing advertising agency, and you've taken time to be so good to so many people, including us. And so that just doesn't happen. You've got you've got a heart. So who's been your inspiration? Many of those female leaders that I described, and other females uh, that. Um, I've worked with um, throughout my career, but truly I've spent the majority of my life in Arizona. I think it's about 18 to 20 years now. So I've been there longer than anywhere else, but I can cite so many examples. When I worked for Steven Spielberg's Manhattan Beach Studios, there was a female head of uh, the public relations team um, who was inspiring. Um, my first job out of college, by the way, I'm an art school dropout who later graduated from ASU's College of Engineering. And now- I know, I was gonna <laughs> ask you about that. Like <laughs> operations, really? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so ultimately I have the heart of an artist and I have the brain of a scientist, right? And so I think that puts me in a unique position that I'm an observer before anything. I mean, my job is to create things from, from what seems to be nothing, but actually the birthplace place of creation is observation. Right. So I've observed these people who have been my inspirations throughout history. And some of them, quite frankly, they are celebrities. I look at Madonna and I look at Lady Gaga. These things don't happen by accident. These are women with grit and determination who said, I know who I am and I have something to offer and I, nothing's going to stand in my way. Right. And um, so, again, I apologize for the male of my species, but there aren't a lot of guys <laughs> like that that I know. Um, a lot of men that I know have very healthy, they, they, have a very, they have a very interesting sense of self. And I find that they ask for things that females would never ask for because they would be ashamed to do so, right? It's just an expansive ego situation that is remarkable. And it's necessary because... Men, you know, men forge ahead no matter what, right? And that's and that sometimes it's important to advance civilization forward. Women, they bring coalitions together and they hold things together. We've had the longest running female monarch in history, right? In 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 Great Britain, um, and um, so uh, to answer your question, I wish I could pinpoint one particular person, but it's my job to take in all that information. And there are so many remar remarkable women, starting with my mom. Um, I would say that probably my mother gave me the many of the gifts that I have because when I was a little boy, she would read to me from the classics. So there was no run, run, uh, run, dick, run, Jane, <laughs> grab the ball. You know, it was it was Treasure Island. It was White Fang. It was Robinson Crusoe. So, in fact, when I was 10 years old, they called my mother into the school principal's office to say they were concerned because I, uh, because of my speech patterns that I articulated too well. 
Um, I think that what they were concerned with was something else, to be quite frank <laughs> with you. But I have my, my mother to thank for my vocabulary and my mother's sense of adventure and, um, and excitement. Mm. She, always made, uh, she always made Halloween costumes for us. Our birthdays were in October. We celebrated them together. My mother instilled to me a sense of awe in the world around me, right? And um, looking back, she was 21 years old and she had two children. She had no car. She had to walk with us to the grocery store. And she and in, in, in the late 1960s, the world was in turmoil. I never knew it. My mother created a fantasy world uh, that I could do anything. And so she is, she is ultimately my greatest inspiration. Go mom. Wow. That's wow. Awesome. Tony, thank you so much for just your transparency today, all that you've shared for women. I know they'll be inspired by it. I'm thrilled that you put a spotlight on local women as well. We need to interview them because they have some amazing stories as well. Amazing stories. Uh, just Nicole Stanton and what she accomplished with her anti-bullying initiative that evolved Absolutely. into children and wellness. You must talk to her. Her work was extraordinary. Facing a legislature that um, was not kind to the concept. They weren't um, aware enough to pass anti-bullying legislation three times. We attempted to get it passed. And finally, the coalition that she built um, was so powerful that eventually she was asked by Michael Crow to bring her Dion initiative to Arizona State University. Um, so that, uh, so she's one that I definitely would love for you to, 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 to meet. And I, you know, I really appreciate everything you guys are doing. I'm such a huge fan. I am here for you. I cannot wait to see the things that you are going to accomplish. I'm so proud of you. And, um, uh, let's uh, 2021 is the year of the female, the decade of the female. Let's make it happen. So how, how can people find you, Tony, if they want to reach out for, for your expertise and talent? How do they find your agency? Uh, you can go to feliceagency.com. While you're there, um, a pop-up, one of those annoying pop-ups will pop up. And my direct number is there. Um, for people that uh, want to, if, if anyone wants to further the conversation we've had today, I'm available. Um, and uh, anyone who has a small to medium sized business that wants to take it to the next level, our agency is really more of a business consultancy. Um, and our creations help our clients make their dreams come true using our, our mastery of the tools available to us in branding, business development, and marketing. So, um, Thank you so much for inviting me on your show. The guest list before me is impressive. So I'm very honored to be here. No, thank you, Tony, so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. You can find more information and connect with Christine or Tony at www.tffei.org or on LinkedIn at the Foundation for Female Equity and Inclusion.